I titled the talk The Hunting of the Leek, An Agony in Eight Drips. And I'm wondering if anybody knows or who knows where that title comes from. But I cheated. <laughs> you cheated and my kids are not allowed to answer. <laughs> no, you can't send The Hunting of the Leek. The Hunting of the Leek. Okay, what of my children can say? Yes? Hunting of the Snark. Uh, hunting of the Snark. Has anybody heard of Hunting of the Snark? Yes. yes. Okay. It was, uh, it's, a, it's a nonsense poem by um, Lewis Carroll, written 140 years ago, about this epic journey of a bunch of characters to find this mythical uh, character, this mythical um, um, thing that's called a snark. And if a snark, if you find the snark and it's a snark, it's a pretty useful thing. You can feed it with greens and it's handy for striking a light. But if your snark isn't a snark, it's a boojum, then you suddenly just disappear off the face of the earth and you're never seen again. <laughs> um, I love the poem not just because it's a, it's a beautiful poem, but also because I see it as an analogy to my journey as a researcher. Um, looking for snarks in, in the form of, of knowledge. We're seeking knowledge and there's no formula. We don't know where it is. We don't know what we, we're going to find. And um, you really follow your curiosity. You find a problem that you're interested in and you, f you try and understand that problem and where it comes from. And, and that process is, is, is a wonderful process to do and it's a wonderful privilege to be at a, at a university where I'm allowed to do that. And that is so important for knowledge development. If I'm always interested in, in the, the, the difference between practice and, and ac ac you know, academia. And um, if you see in, in the academic world, there's lots of ideas. And what's interested is, what you're interested in is, is this a new idea? Is this novel? Well, practic people in practice are interested, can I make money with this? Can I solve problems with this? Can I, you know, what is the use of it? And for every thousand or two thousand ideas that academics come up with, maybe one idea will spin off and become something useful. But you need this engine. You need these people to think about new ideas, pursue them, work very hard to get them. And so this is my journey as being <coughs> um, Hunting of the Snark, and that's why oh, uh, the subtitle of um, <coughs> Lewis Carroll's talk is um, It's a Hunting of the Snark and Agony in Eight Fits. Mm -hmm. That's why my, my talk is uh, Hunting of the Leak and Agony in Eight Drips. <laughs> <coughs> okay, so how do we find this knowledge? How do we discover new knowledge? The answer to that is by any means possible. Um, some of the problems you can just directly do an experiment with. But a lot of the problems, think of global warming, we can't just easily measure it. And you start doing, approaching it from different angles. You do everything that you can until there's sort of a, a, a puzzle that starts coming together and you're starting to see the bigger picture because these different uh, thoughts that you pursue, these different directions, are starting to show you a picture and it's starting to become clear. And um, this is how the bellman in Lewis Carroll tale explains it. It is your glorious duty to seek it, to seek it with thimbles, to seek it with care, to pursue it with forks and hope, to threaten its life with the railway share, to charm it with smiles and soap. <laughs> I would have loved to spend a bit of time teaching you these lines and have you repeat them with me a couple of times during my talk. But we simply don't have the time. Such is human perversity. Right, let me talk about Africa's water problems. South Africa's water problems, but also our continent. And this is not anything new that I'm going to tell you. Um, the fact that if you look at all the, inhab all the inhabited continents, Africa as a country, as the most countries with 
uh, water stress with water scarce, scarcity. So we uh, at the, um, you know, we, we, we don't have in Africa a lot of water as it is. The demand for water is growing as our population grows, as our economies grow, as people expect and want more. Our water supplies are shrinking and the water quality, the quality of our water resources are deteriorating. And then uh, factors like global warming and urbanization is making these problems worse. So we, in a precarious and a difficult situation uh, with our water supplies going into the future. When I started my career, I worked in developing communities. It was quite an exciting time with the new dispensation, with the RDP program, putting in water supply to developing communities. And when I started my academic career, that's the field that I wanted to work in. Um, and I, I became disillusioned with it because, you know, after the third conference going to a very fancy hotel uh, where you get fancy food and you talk about the problems of poor communities um, and you're not hearing anything new, I came to the conclusion that this is not where the solution lies. And so I, I started working in a more technical field. So if you look at any of these problems, um, let's say uh, the scarcity of water or, um, or water quality or anything like that. You know, as an engineer, as a technical person, there's a solution. <clears throat> what do you need? You need three things. You need to know the know-how. You need a technical solution. And we know how to solve a lot of these problems. We know what to do. You need people who can implement it. And we have those people. We have excellent engineers um, in this country. And you need the funding to be able to implement it. And the money is there if you, if you look for it. But these solutions are not happening. And why is that? Uh, and and the, the answer to that is that it's got nothing to do with our ability to solve the problem. It's got everything to do with society and how society operates. But we see that with, with bigger problems, um, such as global warming. We know that's a problem. We know, technically, a lot of what we should be doing. But to get that done is, is very, very hard due to the way our society works. Now, when I look at developing countries, and when I look at South Africa and our, uh, our municipalities, um, the question is, why doesn't it work? Why don't we have uh, good water services in all our towns? Um, and uh, and good, good municipal services. And I've got three reasons. I'm not an expert in that. These, these are just my three top reasons for those problems. The first one would be political interference in managing of our resources, or of our technical resources. Um, a municipality has engineers, technicians, technologists, we call them civil engineering professionals, um, who are responsible for ensuring that the infrastructure is maintained, operational, expanded correctly, and that sort of thing. They should be judged on how well the infrastructure performs. And they should be fired and replaced if they don't do their job. Um, but that should be independent of whoever is the political masters. That is, we all need this infrastructure, and this should be done. Uh, when politicians start interfering, um, it, 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 we, we inevitably start getting short-term gain at the cost of the long-term infrastructure systems that are, should be sustainable. And, and I want to give one example. When we worked, uh, we did a project for the Water Research Commission looking at whether plumbing fittings that are installed in South Africa um, comply with our legal requirements that they are SABS compliant. Um, just out of interest, the answer was that about 50% generally of our plumbing fittings comply. Uh, and if you look at low income developments, it's less than 15%, 1, 5%. Uh, which is shocking because it's government building these houses 
according to not their own rules. Um, and I mean, uh, that, that I must just qualify that this is, that, that part of it wasn't a scientific study. That was just a spot check of 10, ten different studies. So I might be wrong, but I, I suspect that I'm not. Um, and I spoke at, during that project with one of the big metros, uh, one of the civil engineers working for them, and I asked them, um, you know, you have all the power to control this. You've got the legal re you know, legislation behind you, the bylaws. You can say to a developer, I'm not going to connect you until you fix your plumbing fittings and get them um, compliant. Simple as that. And he said to me, no, you can't do that because the, he, the, the counselor came, well, came to him personally and said to him, you will connect that development or that community. And you can understand why. They want the community to be serviced. But we're sitting then with a problem that we have new, you know, we solve a housing problem, but we create a leakage problem. And so we're not sustainable. We're not solving these problems sustainable. And what, what is really, if you think um, a, a, as a civil engineer working for a municipality, if a councillor would tell you that I'd be out of there as soon as I can, you know, to be, have your self-respect to do something that you know is not the right thing, just because some politician is going to get some short-term benefit of it. Not everybody can do that. Fortunately, there are good people who stay and continue to do excellent work. But for me, that's a huge problem, and that, that relates and is one of the causes of the second problem, and that is our lack of qualified and experienced technical staff at municipalities. Um, we, there was uh, one of our presidents of, past presidents of the Institute of Civil Engineering, and I have to get this right because uh, that was Alison Lawless. I'm, I'm always thinking, I should say, I, and I always almost say Alison Lewis and get myself in trouble. That's our dean, it's Alison Lewis, and this was Alison Lawless. She did a study on the numbers of, of engineering professionals at different municipalities. And one of the statistics, the only one that I want to mention, uh, that she said, uh, she found was that the Auckland Zoo in New Zealand has more civil engineering professionals in its service than something like 71% of South African municipalities. Which is shocking. So, how do you build a sewage system? How do you maintain and operate a sewage treatment plant? Um, how do you build a stormwater system? How do you protect people from uh, floods? if you don't have people on the ground who know what to do. So that's a huge problem we, we're sitting with. And, and there are some signs that things are turning around. Um, but we've lost a lot. And the third reason is corruption. And corruption, um, I, I think, is stealing from the poor. You know, me as a, as a middle class person, yes, I find it very worrying. And I, but I can afford to pay for my medical care and policing and so on extra. But the people who really suffer are those people who are vulnerable in our societies. The really poor people, somebody in a township with a disabled child. Um, that's where the money is stolen from. And I, you know, it's just intolerable. Um, the, the money that's paid through backhands is nothing. The damage that is done through infrastructure that we pay, that we install, that is not up to scratch and has to be replaced because, um, or is not doing its service that, it's, that we're paying it for, that cost is much greater. One of the solutions that municipalities have come up in our current drought, um, period of drought, is this, what's called water shedding. We call it intermittent water supply systems. One of the cities that are doing that, anybody from Durban here? <laughs> Nobody, so I can talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask him if he's correct, but I talked to one of the municipal engineers just um, recently who told me that they switch off their water currently at 10 o'clock at night, and they switch it on again at 4 o'clock in the morning. So they're already implementing uh, water shedding. Now, that is not the answer. A water pipe is very different to an electricity uh, wire. 
And let me explain to you why. <coughs> uh, we've got a street running around this building, and on, under the pavement, about a meter deep, there's a water pipe running there. And there's, at certain places, there are connections to houses through a water meter and so on. <coughs> so imagine that pipe, a meter underground, surrounded by soil, which has <laughs> organic matter in which has sand particles in it. There's storm water and pollution that washes from the surface down and surrounds that pipe. There are sewer lines running underground that leak and you've got the sewage pollution coming in contact with our water pipes. When there's pressure in the pipe, that is not a risk. We have leakage, if there's a hole in a pipe, the water goes out, but there's no risk in terms of, of the safety of that water. But when we empty that pipe, then there's an empty pipe with a hole in, with polluted water all around it, and that water enters the pipe. And so the first thing that you lose when you have an intermittent system is your water quality integrity. I'm with water, intermittent water supply, even if I run that tap for an hour, because you cannot guarantee the water quality in that system if you leave it for eight hours for bacteria to grow and fix, you know, fix themselves to the balls and so on. So you lose that integrity. Again, if that happens in Cape Town, I'll be buying water from the stop, store. It's again the poor people who are suffering the brunt of, um, of, of an action like that. Uh, other disadvantages, other negative consequences, the number of, of, of bursts in those pipes increased by 300% based on previous studies. Uh, your water meters uh, are damaged by the sand and grit that you put in there. They can get stuck and they can get damaged. Uh, the other thing that happens, you get air entering the pipes. So when you put water in now, you've opened your tap, the, 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 the air is pushed through your water meter, doing two things. The one is it, it exceeds the speed at which your water meter is supposed to go, and it can cause damage. The second thing is it measures as if it's water. Are you paying for that air that goes splatter, splatter, splatter through your pipe? So we're losing the integrity of our building system. Um, and studies have shown that when you use intermittent systems, water shedding, to try and curb consumption, it only takes about three years for that consumption to go up to past um, the level that it was before you started doing it. So you, you buy yourself three years of time at a huge cost to the system. So whatever we do, uh, we should avoid that um, as much as we can. Okay, now I want to talk about some of my research. I started 15 years ago working on leakage. And it started with going to um, a talk where somebody said that leaks are very sensitive to pressure. So if there's a higher pressure, there's higher leakage, which is logical, but it's, there are more, higher leakage than the theory predicts. And that got me interested. I wanted to understand why do we get these higher leakage rates? Why is, is leakage more sensitive to pressure than the theory suggests or say that it should be? Um, and so I've been, over the last 15 years, working on this conundrum using like I said, I mean, this would be a good time to recite that little piece from Lewis Carroll, but I won't, I won't go there. <laughs> so we use theoretical uh, physics and mathematics, explorations of the basic laws of science. We use laboratory experiments, um, finite element modeling, com computational fluid dynamics modelings. Uh, we use hydraulic network modeling, and we use field work. All of these things to look at different aspects of this of, of trying to figure out what is causing this. The other thing that I love doing is working with other experts in related fields. So I've worked with people in soil mechanics, in computational methods, in, in structural engineering, in statistics, and it's just a wonderful um, environment to work in. So I can summarize everything I learned in the, the last 15 years in just two lines. <laughs> which I'll share with you now. <laughs> the first is that the reason why leaks are so sensitive to pressure is that the leak areas 
I'm not fixed. So if you've got a crack in a pipe and you increase the pressure, that crack will actually expand. And so you'll have a higher velocity, but you'll also have a higher area and you get the sensi sensitivity. So that's the one thing I learned. The second thing I learned is that these ex area expansions are always linear functions of pressure. And which is great news, we like linear functions. Linear functions, you can do all sorts of things that you cannot do with nonlinear functions. And it gives us a lot more power with it. So we very, I'm very happy to be able to share this with you. <laughs> okay, so from this research, we came up with a device um, that we call a pipe condition assessment device. And uh, we're busy um, uh, patenting that through the university. It's, it's going to be a, uh, and so I'm looking at the people from Spur and Fisher, and they're going to jump up if I say something that I shouldn't say. Um, it's on a little trailer that you have one or two operators that can take it from one point to another. It connects to a section of pipe using a hydrant uh, connection. And it does a sophisticated sort of a pressure test on an isolated pipe section. And from those results, we are able to say, what is the condition of that individual pipe to much greater accuracy than we can do with any other method. We can see what, what the sort of leakage rate is, and we can see it, what the type of leaks are that on that system. We can't say where exactly the leaks are, but we're working on that. Um, so that device is one part of our um, or that we're developing, it has two other components. So one component is a, 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 an app, app on your cell phone or a tablet that the operator will have, and which makes them the eyes and the ears of the municipality. So if they see something like an illegal connection or a leak or a, a valve that's in bad shape, they take a picture, the device and the cell phone is, is, is G, GPS uh, coordinates, in it, so it sends up all this information of the test, of the photos, of the notes, uh, where the teams are, what they're doing, it sends it up to the cloud, which is the third part, which is a cloud-based management system. So uh, it's using just a cell phone SMS type of thing to send this data up to a, a central server, and from there we can extract the data sitting anywhere in the world, analyze it. Um, and we hope that uh, we, we're going to run the first, uh, we're busy preparing the first two devices and we're going to run the first field trials in hopefully in Cape Town uh, in the first three months of next year. So we're very excited about that. I've got a further dream for this device. Um, and that is that, and this is where I'm talking about where we hopefully can, can help solve some of these problems that, um, that we are have to address in a developing world context. Um, what I want to be able to do with these devices is create an online market where somebody uh, who is a consultant at, at a local, near a local village can go to that village or town and talk to the, um, to the, to the, um, uh, the town management and get them, if they agree, to make a proposal for analyzing and fixing the leaks in that town. And they'll put that proposal onto the online market where two other parties will join them through some kind of a bidding process. The one would be a, a group of experts, and those experts can sit anywhere in the world. So we, we're bringing these experts to the community who are not there. And the other is the funders. So the experts can then uh, use the maps of the system uh, to, to uh, map out where the, the devices should go. They can track these devices. If you use Uber, if you imagine I'm sit sitting myself, I'm dreaming, uh, you know, looking at a map of Africa and seeing my devices running around everywhere and solving problems. And, um, and so they can see where these devices are. They can schedule where they should go next. They can get the results. They can see what's happening. They can analyze them. And then they can make the plan. They can tell the implementing agents, the local agents, what should be done. And in that way, combine uh, the expertise with local uh, work people on the ground to fix those problems. The funders can have a, 
a, you know, a, a knowledge of their investment being safe by being able to trade, to track, and keep track of the condition of the system over time. So they can ensure that the maintenance is done because uh, these devices can go every year and test the pipes and they can actually get a report every year, an independent report, what is the condition like. So hopefully this can bring together different parties to help us uh, create a solution to some of these problems. Now, even if this thing is going to make a billion dollars, I'm not going to drop my day job. <laughs> okay, I, I love what I'm doing and I'm going to stop doing it. So we need people who are interested in partnering with us, entrepreneurs. We need people who are interested in funding these initiatives. And so I'll just leave that out there. <laughs> okay, this um, in Lewis Carroll's poem, he, he calls them different the eight points he call um, fit, fit the first and fit the second. And this is fit the eighth, I call it drip the eighth. Uh, this is the last point and it's called the vanishing. And I thought that's a good point to finish off my talk. Um, because there's a couple of things that are vanishing. Our water is limited and it's vanishing. And I think that speaks for itself, we need to protect it. <coughs> The second thing that is not quite in the line of my talk, but very topical today, is our university culture, very culture and funding is under threat. We need to get that right, so we can have people who can pursue their, um, their, their interest and generate ideas, generate knowledge, some of which will become solutions to our problems. And the last thing is that we will all be vanishing. In hundred years, none of us will be here, but our children will and our children's children will. So when we talk about water, that is what we should be thinking about. Thank you very much. Uh -huh.